Content warning. Some of the stuff in here is medical trauma. Hello, everyone. Hey there, folks. This is Avery. This is Rita. And you're listening to I, I Don't, Don't Know, Know Her, the podcast where we talk about women and some other folks that you've probably never heard of. But you should have. And today, you, you will. will. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. Nailed it. <laughs> I got in an argument with someone. <laughs> Rita, you get in a lot of arguments. <laughs> This one was interesting. So this was with a friend of mine, and he's white. Okay. And made the comment, I don't see color. Oh, God, no. And I was like, no. (laughs) And my reaction was, lucky for fucking you. Yeah. And it started a conversation. Um, His point of view was... Being a very wrong, <laughs> <laughs> being, being very like open minded, like trying to accept everybody, trying thinking, well, I'm a good person, so don't be f- dissing on white people. Yeah, <laughs> and I was like, let me tell you <laughs> why you're wrong. <laughs> yes, and I was trying to explain. I was like, the reason I made that comment is like it's it's not personal. For for my comment to you, for you, it's personal for me. Mm-hmm. I said, as a brown person in this world, walking around, I was like, have you ever been followed in a, in a store? store? Have you ever been spit on and called a racial slur? Because I have. Yeah. And he was like, no. And I was like, yeah. So. Or you have to question if the reason you're getting in trouble in class Yes. Do you deserve it? Or is it because you're being targeted? Or if you're in a room full of white people and you make sure that you're acting accordingly. Mm -hmm. Do you have to code switch? Yes. Had no idea of those things. And so I was saying like, and also still was kind of arguing with me. And I was like, hey, I was like, instead of like being offended and getting heated why don't you listen to the person of color who's talking to you right now? Who's taking time out of their day to educate your ass. Yes. Also, shouldn't have to do that, but willing to. Um, And I kind of like stopped the fighting part of it and was like, hey, like I'm really trying to put myself out there for you as a person of color and let you know what my world is like. Could you please just listen Mm -hmm. to my experience? And we calmed down. We did talk about it, but I was wondering like, should I have done that? Should I have taken that time? Well, how do you feel afterwards? Did you feel like you made an impact or did you feel used? I did feel like I made an impact, but it's fucking exhausting. And it's like, why? Why? Like, I could have just been fucking pissed and been like, I'm going to fucking leave this conversation. What started the conversation? Like, what was the impetus of him being like, I don't see color? Um... We were with a group of people, and I, I forget how it started, but somebody said something about being a person of color, and it was another person of color that said that. And he said, well, I don't see color. Yeah. And so that's when I was like, no. And did the other person of color who was in the group didn't say chime anything. in? No. No. Interesting. I mean, like, nobody is required to ever educate somebody else. I would have been like, Google is free. <laughs> <laughs> but I was, I guess, bringing this up, I'm wondering, like, should I continue to do that? Or should I? I feel conflicted. <laughs> you right, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, I obviously have no idea what that's like for you. But I do know when people ask me stuff about gay stuff or trans stuff, you know, can be very taxing. Like we have a we have a person in common who had said that exact same thing another time and I lost my shit. Mm-hmm. 
And I got into one of the biggest fights of my life with that person. And I was like, I can't even look at you. (laughs) Yeah. Because I was so upset. I was like, you know, how privileged is it of you that you don't get to fucking see color while the rest of the people who have to just walk around on this planet living it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I told him, too. I was like, that is privilege. And if and he was like, oh, here we go, like bashing. And I was like, no, it's a privilege. I was like, and what I was trying to explain was like, I'm not personally attacking you. And even if you were, welcome. (laughs) Welcome to the party of what it's like to be personally attacked on a regular fucking basis for existing. Exactly. And I was like, too, I was like, you get to you get to choose. I was like, as a white Hetero male, hetero male in this world, you fucking shit gold bricks. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, you just take a se- don't get so blindsided by I'm a good person. Because you probably aren't as good as you think you are. Well, if you're saying shit like that, there's yes, guaranteed. Yes. No gold star for you today, buddy. No. <laughs> yeah. You know, when I had that conversation with the friend that I was discussing, you know, I got really upset about everything he was saying. Cause he said basically like, I don't see color and I don't see sexuality. I was like, well, (laughs) then you don't see, then you don't see me. You don't see me. You don't see us. We don't exist to you. And he was like, it's not like that. And then he was constantly doing that thing where he's like playing devil's advocate, whatever, you know? And I was just, I behaved in a way that I don't particularly like for myself. I I got extremely upset. It was in a public place. I'd had like three beers. So I was a little bit feisty and I made an embarrassment out of myself. And I was so heated about it, like so emotionally, like at a 10, um, that I, I realized that like I'm doing so much emotional labor for this person. See, that's how I feel. And I think that's why I'm thinking about it. not meeting me halfway. Yeah. Um, I will say though, as you're, as you're contemplating which times you engage in these conversations and which times you decide not to for your own mental health, I will say that that same person later, like a year or two later was like, Hey, I have never stopped thinking about that conversation I understand so much more now. I've 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 read more. I know what you were saying, and I would never say that again now. Well, that's good. Yeah. So it's like it made a difference to that person, but I also think it's it's hard to figure out which people are worth your time because some of them are gonna be like your friend, right? Put up the defenses. And not really listen to you or hear you at that time, but potentially it plants a seed and they do the work later. But is that your job? Yeah. That's what I mean. I mean, I, that's why I'm still thinking about it this morning. I'm like, did I do myself a disservice by putting in that energy? Well, how do you feel? Do you feel that way? Do you feel like you were used or you were a you did labor for somebody who wasn't even appreciating it. Yeah. Yeah. And it feels ucky. <laughs> well, and you've been doing that a lot lately. Cause you were also telling me about that conversation with your coworker who, um, Oh, I can't even remember what exactly he said, but it was something very similar to that. And you two got into quite a big argument about race and stuff like that. And he was like, yeah, I just don't believe in this shit or whatever. <laughs> it was like cool for you white dude you don't have to fucking deal with it yeah and i guess that's maybe why i'm feeling like conflicted i'm just like i'm so tired <laughs> i'm so tired of this conversation but i still feel like i have to do it to at least like please see me yeah maybe try I mean, I think it's hard if you're in a group conversation like that and that is the topic. Like, how do you not address it? Yeah. Kind of. Um, I don't know. I I guess I have a little bit of a, a different perspective now because I we have the show and we are already doing a lot of education of ourselves and for other people. I'm like, you know, I, I already do enough of this and <laughs> I already do enough of it at work, right? Mm-hmm. 
Um, so much so that I've decided to file a discrimination complaint mm-hmm. because I'm tired of having to do all of the work for other people who need to know what their job is. Yeah. I I guess I'm like definitely at a point where I just don't give a shit to um, put in that kind of time. Mm-hmm. If it was somebody I felt close to, felt like we're, we're, was going to hear me, then maybe I would. Yeah. And this person is somebody, you know, that I work with, somebody I respect, has very different political points of view than I do. Um, but I get along with him very well. And so then I was like, well, I'm just going to put it out there. Like, maybe try. How long ago was this conversation? A couple days. And how have things been since? Wonderful. Has he? No. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even ask the question. You were already no, nope. no. So, if that were to happen again with that same person or another person, what do you think you would do next time? Um, I guess it would depend on the person. Like, if it's somebody that I know is just a complete piece of shit, and I'm just like, you will, you will never change. You're solid in what you are thinking. I will have no influence, and so I will not waste my time. Um, This person that I was talking to, I felt like we've had really good conversations before, and um, I just thought I would try, but I also feel kind of sad Mm. that I have to try. Certainly. Yeah. It's unfair, obviously. Um, he He gets to go home and not think about it, and you have to still think about it. Yeah. And that's just shitty. Yeah, I I mean, obviously, it's always going to be a case-by-case basis for you. But you can always decide not to do that not work to do for it. somebody else. Yeah. Especially if you know it's just going to drain you and they're going to go away from the conversation without any kind of difference. I feel like, too, I have a problem of, like, someone will say something and it just sparks the fire. Yeah. And I get pulled in. And then you're like, oh, I'm the one that got burned. <laughs> yes. Yes. I mean, certainly that's what happened to me in the in the conversation I had with, you know, a friend about that kind of stuff. I. Yeah, I I know that for sure, even though he thought about the conversation later and and did some work for sure, I experienced actual harm. Mm hmm. You know, that stuck with me and has continued to stick with me. Yeah. And so while it while it worked or whatever, like it I did something, it doesn't mean it still doesn't, doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good. <laughs> You're like, I get this off of me. <laughs> I need to take a shower. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess I'm just putting it putting it out there for, you know, whoever's listening at this episode of you know, pick your, pick your battles. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Yeah. Don't do free labor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for people who, especially for people who are clearly not even willing to meet you in the yeah, middle. In the middle. Yeah. Yep. Alrighty. There's our lesson for today. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. You got a person. I do. Um, I didn't even realize this, but I guess this season I'm on a bit of a disability kick. Okay. <laughs> I, I didn't intentionally think that. I was like, you know what? I haven't done an activist for a while. I think I'm going to do an activist. And then, well, actually I did the deaf rights activist, right? Yeah, you did. Um, so I was like, oh, I think I'll do somebody like that. And so I found this person. Her name is Barbara Waxman Fiducia. I don't know her. She was a disability activist, author, and educator. Now, her story is relatively short, so a lot of what I'm going to talk about in her story is the work that she did. Okay. Um, And I'm going to actually pull out some of her writings, because she was an incredible writer, really great research scientist, like researcher, not scientist, but that kind of policy sort of research. Okay. And also, there's just so many things that she talks about that interweave with so many areas of our lives, so... 
anytime you want to ask a question, please do. Cause I did like, as I, I mentioned this to Rita yesterday, <laughs> I absolutely did like six hours of research of stuff that never made it into this. <laughs> so feel free to stop me anytime and ask me any questions. I can probably answer them. You can probably answer. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to keep that. I read pocket. a ridiculous amount of stuff. Okay. <laughs> Barbara Faye Waxman was born on April 1st, 1955 in Los Angeles. Her parents were Saul and Toby Waxman. I love the idea of Toby as a woman's name. I think that's fucking great. Yeah. Barbara and her brother, Michael, were both born with a condition called spinal muscular atrophy. It is a genetic disease. That sounds serious. Yes. It causes your muscles to become weak and waste away. That's the atrophy part. Mm Mm-hmm. Many folks who have this condition lose the nerve cells in their spinal cord that control muscle movement. So basically, your your brain, your muscles are not receiving the, the signals from your brain, the nerve signals. And so because of that, that's why they weaken and they atrophy, because they're not being like told to move correctly. Um, Barbara also had arthrogryposis. Is that like arthritis? Kind of. It is a condition that limits. It's like a, it's kind of like when people are like autoimmune disease. <laughs> oh, like an umbrella it is, term. It's an umbrella term. And it usually has multiple um, various disorders or, or diseases or whatever that go into it. Conditions. So this, it specifically though, is a condition that limits the motion um, of your joints. Okay. That sounds awful. I yeah. mean, spinal stuff and then your limbs. So was she able to like walk? Well, we're going to get there. Okay. So her, uh, the the first one is muscle based, right? It wastes away your muscles. And then the second one targets the joints. So she not only was um, having issues with muscle stuff, but then also couldn't, couldn't um, all the way extend or bend her arms or legs. Yikes. Yeah. Um, she also had to use a ventilator in order to breathe. Um, so she was hooked up to a ventilator and her parents were told by the doctors that she wouldn't live past the age of 30. Spoiler alert, they're wrong. <laughs> okay. Barbara used a ventilator. She was able to walk as a child, um, though it was not easy for her uh, because it is a progressive disease. Mm-hmm. So initially she was able to walk and she could be relatively independent, but her, so her parents were like, what do we do when we go to enroll her in school? Mm -hmm. Because again, when she's going to be enrolled in school, it's the early sixties. Yes. There's just not a lot out there. No. And so they're, they were faced with a really common dilemma for kids, for parents of kids with special needs. Do I put them exclusively in a special ed class? Or do I enroll them in their reg- in like quote unquote regular class? Mm-hmm. And her parents decided that she would get a better education if she went into the quote regular classes, so that she was with um, non disabled peers. Mm-hmm. So, it was good intentions for Barbara. It was awful. She described uh, it as hell. Yeah, <laughs> her schooling, teachers and students. Um, either treated her like she didn't exist or they bullied her. Teachers as well. What the hell? So the New York Times did an overlooked on her, an overlooked obituary on her, and there were specific stories that they pulled into this overlooked obituary that Barbara had told somewhere. Couldn't find the original. I tried, but I couldn't find it. So when she was in grade school... There was a research, research, recess teacher who would continuously get on her ass to run. You need to run, 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 but she can't run. Like that's not possible. So she would like fall and the teacher would like bully her. Get up, get running. Oh my gosh. And in high school, there was a classroom, her math class had an uneven carpet and you know, she doesn't have great mobility, so Mm -hmm. the uneven carpet would often trip her, and she would fall, and the math teacher would just stare at her and walk past her. This, what the fuck? (laughs) Like, I don't understand that. 
And like, also, you didn't think to like put down a piece of tape so that the carpet was no longer gonna trip her. Yeah, like how evil. Um, in the, later on, Barbara said that quote, "In those twelve years, I believe it was my disability they saw, forgetting that it was a child who possessed it." Yeah, they didn't see her at all. No, like they just treated her like she didn't deserve to exist. Wow. And this is in this is in California. This is yeah. in LA. Yeah, this is in LA. <laughs> wow. And if it was like that in LA, imagine what it was like in, you know. I mean, also though, like maybe that is part of the problem. Maybe it's because she was in a huge city. If she was in her little small rural community, maybe, maybe everybody Maybe they would have tended to her a little bit better. Maybe. It's hard to say. It, yeah. I think regardless, it's obvious that there was no standard of care. mm mm-hmm. Mhm in that school system for kids with disabilities, particularly one with complex disabilities Mm -hmm. like Barbara had. Almost treating her like a, like a burden rather than just a student who was there to learn. Correct. Um, We're actually going to talk a little bit about that a little later. So put a pin in that. Barbara was a really, despite the fact that she had (laughs) these shitty teachers, Mm -hmm. she was a really bright kid, a bright young person and a, really terrific writer and she was able to um, not only graduate but she attended um, California State University Northridge and got her bachelor's degree in psychology oh wow and I can only imagine based on like when we talked about Kitty Cone and remember um, how hard it was for her to navigate the university campus yes I can only imagine that 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 Barbara had an even harder time um, because she had more complex issues Mm mm-hmm Barbara, uh, after college, Barbara was hired to work for Planned Parenthood in 1978, which seems like a really great fit for her. Um, She was a health educator and the Disability Project Coordinator. Wow. Yes. Big titles, important jobs. Very. And she was working with a lot of disabled women specifically and giving them a lot of education about reproduction, like reproductive rights sexual health, things like that. And she was really moved to work in this area because so many disabled women were basically treated like they were asexual. Like they didn't have... they're not going to have a sexual life? Correct. Okay. Fuck that. Yes. In 1994, she wrote a paper. And at the beginning of the paper, she recounts the story of a woman who went to the emergency room for severe abdominal pain. She was in a ton of pain. The doctors immediately took her into the operating room and they began to perform an appendectomy. Okay. It's a major surgery. Very much so, yeah. After the surgery, they told her there was actually nothing wrong with her appendix. It was perfectly healthy. And so they were like, well, we can't figure out what's wrong. And then what was really wrong was that she had a fucking STD. Oh. They, it hadn't even occurred to them. Like, maybe we should take a a urine sample (laughs) and test. Okay. They just, they didn't, it didn't even occur to them because she was wheelchair bound. So they just did not believe that she could or would have had an active sex life. That's so dismissive. (laughs) Yeah. But also like dangerous, right? Like, yeah. Oh, she's in a wheelchair. She's obviously not. Oh, she can't have sex. Who would have sex with her? Like, that's their fucking line of thinking. Yeah. And it obviously results in a lack of access to appropriate health care. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, in 1985, Barbara testified before Congress at a hearing about Title IX um, when they oh. were considering expanding Title IX. And she was telling the committee that they needed to have more education for people with disabilities regarding sexual health and reproduction And she told the committee, this congressional committee, that she worked with a lot of clients at Planned Parenthood who would, for instance, go in to see their doctors for routine sexual health care, like a pap smear, for example. Yeah. They would go in to get a pap smear and the doctor wouldn't perform it. And they would send these disabled women to their orthopedists. What? 
Yeah, they're like, oh, well, you're in a wheelchair. You have a joint problem. Go see your orthopedist. It's like, I I just want a fucking pap smear. Yeah. My vagina has nothing to do with my spinal cord. No. Also, cervical cancer doesn't grow in your spine. Exactly. (laughs) Uh, It reminded me very much of, um, I listen to a lot of what Aubrey Gordon um, says and what she writes. And she's a fat activist. And she talks a lot about that as a fat woman going into like, hey, my you know, I'm, I'm having a really bad stomach pain. And they're like, have you tried losing weight? <laughs> no. Or like one time she was telling a story about a woman who broke her wrist and she went in to get a cast, right? She got x-rays and a cast. And like, while they're doing it, they're like, uh, let's talk about your diet. What does that have to do with my fucking wrist? No, I'm here being treated for this. Yeah, can we just talk about my wrist? That's what I'm here for. And that's a similar thing that was happening to disabled women, which um, Aubrey Gordon also uh, talks a lot about. Um, fatness should be included in that kind of arena mm-hmm. because it's treated that way. Yeah. Though her work was obviously very important to her and the disabled people she served, um. Barbara really struggled at Planned Parenthood and she really was starting to have a lot of mixed emotions about working there. In what way? Well, there were more than a few times that Barbara witnessed what she considered to be eugenicist ideas espoused by her coworkers. Really? Yeah. So like pregnant women would come in for prenatal screenings And if they discovered that the fetus had a disability, Barbara said that she often heard the staff telling women who had babies with disabilities that they needed to abort. Mm -hmm. And this is what she said later to the New York Times, quote, there was a feeling that there were bad babies. There was a strong eugenics mentality that exhibited disdain, discomfort, and ignorance toward disabled babies. And Barbara is not off the mark because Planned Parenthood, as we've discussed before, began with Margaret Sanger, who Mm -hmm. was an open eugenicist. Yes. Um, She was actually a proponent of what was considered, quote, negative eugenics, which is the idea that humans could be improved if we weed out the, quote, unfit. Mm. And (laughs) Margaret Sanger believed that, quote, profoundly retarded people should be segregated from the rest of the population and sterilized. Wow. Uh, She also espoused the very fucking wild idea that people who wanted to start a family or have children needed to get a permit first. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) A permit, like a a parking pass. (laughs) Yep. And they they needed to attend classes, like to be able to get the permit, like a driver's license. Mm -hmm. It's pretty wild. That is very wild. Also of note, um, this is beside the point, but kind of in in my head, it has meaning. Um, so Planned Parenthood like started as one thing that had a different name. And one of the earliest iterations of what would eventually become Planned Parenthood had a board of directors. And she like handpicked the board of directors. And one of the people the, on the earliest um, board of directors, one of the founding members was a Klansman. Whoa. That's awful. Yeah, it's pretty not great. That's not great at all. No. After leaving Planned Parenthood, Barbara wrote and spoke about the pervasiveness of eugenics in the reproductive health world. Obviously of disabled women is what her purview was. Mm -hmm. She wrote an article called Up Against Eugenics, Disabled Women's Challenge to Receive Reproductive Health Services for the Journal Sexuality and Disability. And I'm going to share a quote from that. In disabled women's history, family planning and reproductive health services have been largely aimed at keeping disabled women from having children. In fact, well over three quarters of Americans view a woman's disability as an acceptable reason for her to be prevented from having children. The use and abuse of sterilization, abortion, and Depo-Provera, especially directed at developmentally disabled women, have furthered this societal expectation. Implicit and explicit statements made by non-disabled health service providers to women who are deaf, blind, developmentally, or physically disabled reveal the reasons why this population of women are underserved. Quote, you do not need gynecological care because you are not sexually active or sexual. 
What do you mean you have a sexually transmitted disease? You're disabled. You shouldn't have or can't have children because you were disabled. Disabled women have faced physicians who have not listened to them or believed what they said, withheld knowledge, lied to them, treated them without their consent, not warned them of negative effects of treatments, experimented on them or used them as teaching material, administered treatments which resulted in death, and removed reproductive organs which were in no way diseased. Whew. That's a lot. It's heavy. That's very heavy. It is a violation of their fucking human rights. Exceptionally so. I actually, this is one of the rabbit holes I fell down. I was looking at timeline of disability um, rights overall, and the amount of stuff that was in there about sterilization of women without their informed consent Mm -hmm. was really horrendous. And sometimes they weren't women. Often they were fucking children. Oh, one of the cases I read was an 11 year old girl and they cut off her boobs. They like removed her breasts um, and sterilized her and like sewed her up. Oh, my God. It was fucking horrendous she, when she was 11. Because she was disabled? Mm-hmm. Whoa. Whoa. The fuck? And that was in the U.S.? Yes. And it was like, it was, um, their reasoning was, is that she would, like, scratch a lot and, like, hit her head a lot on, like, the walls and stuff. And she was really fascinated with... Like when she would make herself bleed and they were like afraid if she menstruated that she would do something harmful to herself. And so the judge agreed and that's why they were allowed to perform these fucking horrendous surgeries on her when she was 11. Jesus. Yikes. Yeah. That is It was like from the ages of 11 to 13. She was just constantly in surgeries. Jeez. Fucking gross. Um, Even cases up until as recent as 2013 and 2014, I found, of women who were disabled and are found, quote, incompetent, were sterilized by court order. Yeah. When you mentioned, you said the judge. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wait, we're in courts for this? This is being allowed legally. (laughs) Yes. It's like being fought about in courts. Wow. Yeah. And of course, those are the ones who were lucky enough to actually get a court case, right? Yeah. There were so many women who who, just passed along. Who were forcibly sterilized and never had a voice. They didn't know. Some of them didn't, like, literally didn't understand that that's what had happened. You know, I, I, um, when I was doing the research on Tanya Zolotaroff Nash, who was the deaf rights activist, I came across multiple testimonies of deaf women who went in to give birth and came out sterilized Mm -hmm. because they would take them into the operating room afterwards. And like, while they were giving birth, they would just stare, they would just sterilize them right there. And they didn't know. And nobody's communicating with them. So it was happening. It was very fucking pervasive and it's still happening. Uh, And I find that really gross. Yeah. (laughs) I actually read a really interesting article that was written recently, recent-ish, in 2013. It was by a person named Allison, I think, Piepmeyer, called, quote, The Inadequacy of Choice, Disability, and What's Wrong with Feminist Framings of Reproduction. So she was specifically talking about, like, the choice, what we what we call as, like, pro-choice, right? The, the self-determination to keep or abort a pregnancy. Mm-hmm. In it, the author calls, I think, calls back a lot to what Barbara was writing about, about eugenicist thinking being applied to pregnant people with fetuses that they know have a disability. As science in reproductive health has gotten more advanced and you can do a lot more prenatal tests to discover Mm -hmm. if, you know, for instance, Huntington's disease is is present, um, there are a lot more of those kinds of situations, those dilemmas that are happening for people. And she um, points out that many people, including feminists, quote, describe giving birth to a person with a disability as an act of harm or cruelty, even as a crime. Deeply stereotypical framings that individuals with disabilities might well dispute. People with disabilities were being defined as, quote, a huge drain on society. Wow. And so... That's where that... Being a burden. 
Yes, that burden idea. And that's that's eugenicist thinking. It just is. If that's how you feel about an entire group of people and you're applying that thinking, like if a baby has Down syndrome, you should abort. Like that's eugenics. You can't walk away from that. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I guess I had not realized how pervasive that mentality is among basically everyone. As Piet Meyer and Barbara Waxman before her had pointed out, a prevailing pro-choice argument, like this is a literal pro-choice argument, and I don't think I'd ever paid attention to it before, is that abortion should be legal, right? This is like a thing where you can get even conservatives on your side. Abortion should be legal in cases of rape, incest, and disability. So they're putting the fact of disability on the same level as rape. Yes. Okay. Although now they don't say disability, they say the health of the baby or the mother. But that's often what they're meaning. Like, I had always assumed, you know, like we've heard about cases where women are pregnant with a child that is, like, already dead. Mm -hmm. and it, or, or giving birth might kill the mother, whatever. But there's a lot more of them are situations like what they're discussing. Yeah. Which is that they discover that their baby has is some kind of abnormality. Disability. Yeah. yeah. And that that's the reason. And that just your average Joe is on board with that. It's, too, the fact that what she saw, too, while working at Planned Parenthood of the staff encouraging, like, you should probably, I mean, I feel like that should be the option for the person, not saying, like, this is what you should do. Because it's planting a seed of, like, oh, well, the doctor's telling me to do so, so maybe I should. Yeah, you know, I was the that article I read from the 2013 feminist studies. That woman actually, the point of her article was that, um, you know, pro choice activists and feminists in general, when they talk about reproductive rights, have a long way to go before they can move away from this very eugenicist framing. And she spoke about, like, specifically, their. Like herself, she um, wrote an op-ed in the Times about her pregnancy and discovering that her baby had Down syndrome and that they had a tough conversation, decided they definitely wanted to keep their child. And um, the comments were like, this is horrific. This is cruel. You're, you're, so this is, this is a wrongful birth. What? your baby is going to be a drain on society. I don't want my taxes to pay for your baby. Like it was fucking gross. Yikes. And she, so because of that, that's why she started doing this research and started talking to a whole bunch of women. Um, she did interviews with women all over the country about their experience, um, discovering in their pregnancy that there was some kind of, um, quote unquote abnormality and what their decision making process was. Mm -hmm. And there was one woman in particular who talked about how um, she sat, she was a single woman was in her PhD studies and she sat down with her family and she told them what, what had happened and they all were like crying and you know, they're like, Oh my God, a baby with down syndrome. And her mom was like, you need to abort. And she she was like, I just don't know if that's what I want. And like her, her stepmother was like, like busted through the conversation was like, please don't do that. I I will take care of this baby. Like, you don't need to even be involved, but I can't let you do that. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time somebody had like stepped forward to be like, oh, I can, I can help you. Mm -hmm. And she later on told a story about being in the elevator with a coworker and she told her coworker, who was also a friend, and the coworker was like, Oh, okay, well here are some resources. These are the people I know, blah, 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 blah. And she just like looked at her stunned and she was like, Is that like but what do you think? Like how do what do you think about that? And she was like, Well, I don't know what you mean. Like, I think you're gonna have some challenges, so I have some resources for you. Yeah. 
And it was that was the first time that somebody hadn't treated it like it was a tragedy. Yeah, and that here's your here's a path in case this is what you want to if you're doing this. Yeah. yeah, I mean, she was like, I don't think there's anything different. It's like some kids, you know, you know, she was just basically like, everybody needs assistance in raising their child. Children are raised by community, not by a single individual. Mm-hmm. And in your case, we need to have more resources set up for you. And there's, it's going to be fine. But it was the first time somebody had even approached her with the idea that it wasn't an absolute tragedy. Yeah. So that was really eye opening for me. (laughs) And I think that there's probably plenty of people who are listening to this who've, who've either seen that, witnessed it or experienced it in their families or in friends or whatever. Mm -hmm. And as you were saying, like, yeah, equating rape and incest with disability as if they're like the same, same. Yeah. Is not only disgusting, but it's obviously very dehumanizing of people with disabilities and it paints them as damaged goods or tragedies. Mm -hmm. And those are some of the beliefs that Barbara spent her whole life trying to combat. After she left Planned Parenthood, Barbara was hired as the director of the California Family Health Council's Americans with Disabilities Act project in 1993. So just as a, like a brief, the ADA was passed in 1990. Okay. So now she's being hired to basically run ADA projects for these big organizations. Two years later, she actually became the ADA project director for the Los Angeles Regional Family Planning Council where she continued to work on issues of reproductive health for women with disabilities. There was at some point she did go back to school and she was in graduate school in the school of architecture and urban planning at UCLA. I think she was probably doing uh, work on like uh, accessibility and mobility stuff. Oh yeah. That's very similar to Kitty Cone. Yeah. I didn't, however, find any information about whether or not she actually finished her degree. And there's a lot more about like her work rather than that. So, I, okay. And the only reason I know she was even a student is because she was featured in a magazine. She wrote a little article. And at the bottom, her little bio was like, Ms. Waxman is a graduate student in the school of. <laughs> and I oh, was like, oh, okay. that's how I found out. <laughs> In addition to her focus on reproductive health, Barbara also advocated for um, sexuality and sexual agency for women with disabilities. She felt that disability rights movement um, needed to be broader to go beyond just talking about accessible curbs (laughs) and public transportation, (laughs) and she thought it needed to move into the bedroom. Quote, why hasn't our movement politicized our sexual oppression as we do transportation and attendance services? Disabled people want to be loved and find sexual fulfillment. I believe we don't speak out because we believe we are ultimately to blame for not getting laid. That is somehow personal oh, inferiority. Man. She talked she talked about like the women who would come in and they would just be like bereft with loneliness. I couldn't even imagine. They didn't even think they were allowed to be sexual. You know, well, like the, a lot of the women told. <laughs> A lot of the women that she encountered. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's because the society is reinforcing this idea that you are not a sexual being. Yeah. Barbara wanted to be seen as a sexual being. Um, she was a very sharp dresser. And she talked about sex a lot. And she was really excited about finding sexual partners and talked about it openly, which was a pretty big deal at the time. Um, She actually even wrote an article um, called Sexual Imagery of Physically Disabled Women, Erotic, Perverse, Sexist. She wrote, quote, Historically, disabled women have had a difficult time finding accurate information about sexuality or body image. They often feel their questions about orgasm, fertility, sexual positions, childbirth, breast size, and weight gain are evaded or disregarded. This is devastating to women who must work against social stigma to feel good about their bodies and believe they are Mm -hmm. entitled to sexual pleasure. Yeah. In the article, she was... The reason why the title is so kind of funny, I think. Erotic question mark? Perverse question mark? Sexist question mark? (laughs) Is because what, what she was doing is like a cursory look into what was at that time the current imagery like pornography basically that had um, disabled women Mm -hmm. in it. And one of the ones she looked at was 
Uh, there was a the f- first disabled woman who posed for Playboy. Okay. Uh, but she notes in there that like they made sure her wheelchair was not in the shot. They they didn't actually show her the, her full legs. Um, they showed her from like the knees up. They shot her from the knees up, and she was white and thin and well endowed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so she was like, you know. And Hugh Hefner was like, oh, we we just don't want to attract fetishists. And that's a real that's a real concern, right? Yes. That there are people who have fetishes towards various people with disabilities. Mm-hmm. Um, apparently, at the time, the, one of the very first <laughs> fucking porn websites, because this is like 1999. Okay. Well, yeah. That's, was like, that's on the cusp. It was like amputee fetishes. So there was like a... It's it's a it's a, it's a hard line, right? Like it's hard to figure out where embracing sexuality and sh- and and having pornography goes. Where does it where does it where they're being blur um, into abused in that way? Yeah, yeah, exploited, exploited. So she was really like talking that it was sort of like this really interesting little glimpse into what at the time was the only imagery that was available. Mm-hmm. Um, Obviously, the internet is a way different place now. Yes. But I would imagine there's still a, quite a bit of that, um, just as there is with lesbians, for example. Mm-hmm. You know, it's really, it's easier now. But I remember even when I was first looking, it was very hard to find lesbian pornography that wasn't for the straight male gaze. Yes. And I imagine that that's the same thing that that a lot of disabled individuals encounter when they're looking for pornography that accurately represents them Mm -hmm. is that it's often for the white male gaze, yeah, the white male able bodied gaze. Community, it's it's like looking through blurry glass. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So she really was. um, That was another thing she was trying to shine a light on, and I thought that was just really awesome. Well, it's a wonderful conversation for their community. Like, mm-hmm. it's and for uh, honestly, for everybody, for everybody, because we should see people with disabilities as sexual beings. All of us. It doesn't have to be just disabled people who see disabled people mm-hmm. as sexual beings. We should all be able to see that. It's actually one of the things I loved about Sex Education, the show on Netflix. Oh yeah, you've been telling me to watch that because there is a disabled character in there who is just smoking hot. <laughs> <laughs> And there is a scene where um, his love interest is like, you know, can you get hard? And he was like, I can. Um, and she was like, can you, t- are you okay with m- telling me like where you feel things and what I can issue? He was like, yes, here's what I like. And he was like telling her like, please kiss me here. Please touch me this. Um, and I was like, this is, th- we need more of that. <laughs> well, so that it's like part of our culture mm-hmm. because they are the part of our culture. It just needs to be seen. Right. And it represented. Needs, needs to not be like this invisibility. And I thought that they did a, I, I'm obviously I'm coming from the point of view of an, of a person who doesn't have a physical disability. So I maybe activists hated it. <laughs> I thought it was just quite well done at the time. So in, uh, fortunately for Barbara, in 1992, she met a man named Daniel Fiducia. He had survived childhood cancer and had become an activist for cancer survivors. Radiation treatment had damaged his bones. And so like Barbara, he had a mobility aid that he used to get around and also, like Barbara, he worked for disability rights. So when the two uh, met, it was basically love at first sight. Oh. <laughs> they wanted to get married. But they discovered that if they did, that would mean that their combined income would put them over the Medicaid-Medicare threshold. Oh, no. And that would mean that they would not be able to have access to like life-saving stuff. That's so shitty. So they had to choose between love, like, like, and also, as we know from gay marriage, uh, 
it's not just about, I want to marry this person I'm with. It's also, there are dozens, if not hundreds of benefits that you get only if you get married. Mm -hmm. So what they're basically doing is it's a government program to discriminate against disabled people. Mm -hmm. They're not allowed to get married or they'll lose their benefits. You shouldn't have to choose. And that's still true today. Um, I was, I've not, I'm not well versed in it, but I've definitely seen across the board, a lot of people talk about when we talk about marriage equality, there is no such thing because disabled people still can't get married because they lose access because of these really restrictive income restrictions. Mm -hmm. So Barbara and Daniel decided they were going to do something about this. (laughs) They, uh, marched over to D.C. and brought along some other activists and they knocked on doors and cornered Congress people and really lobbied for them to change this. And it was looking really promising. The Clinton administration was in uh, office at the time and they were very vocal about and supportive of disability rights. So they were like, this is our moment. We're going to get this changed. And It was looking favorable, but then the Congressional Budget Office put out a report and said that it was going to be too expensive. Okay. It was going to cost too much money. So the bill died before it was ever even voted on. But even though that bill died, Barbara and Daniel and the other activists were able to push the federal government to adopt new rules that allowed states to grant waivers to individual couples. So Barbara and Daniel were, in fact, granted an individual waiver. But that seems real gross, too. Mm -hmm. Basically, if Abby and I were a disabled couple, we would have to apply to the state of Washington to get a waiver so we could get married. A hoop to jump through. Another one. Yeah, it's discrimination. It is. It's just bald-faced fucking discrimination. And it shouldn't be allowed. In July of 1996, Daniel and Barbara did get married. They married in a small Catholic ceremony in Cupertino, California, which is where they were living at the time. A year later, they actually renewed their vows. Oh. This time in a Jewish service um, with hundreds of guests. She wore a teal and bronze gown, and they they did all of the traditional um, ceremonial stuff for a Jewish ceremony. Including um, the bride is supposed to circle the groom seven times. So she did so on, <laughs> uh, in her wheelchair. And people said she was like, she looked like a, a queen with her st- on her steed. <laughs> and I thought this was really cool. During the reception, they'd actually cover the dance floor with bubble wrap. So like as you would wheel over it, it would make, it would pop. <laughs> you would make noise and pop. And I just thought that's so creative and fun. And they even ended the night with fireworks. Oh, Barbara continued to work on disability causes, pushing for broadening the Americans with Disabilities Act, expanding the income cutoff for Social Security and other disability benefits. And in one of her last pushes, she advocated for disability to be included in hate crime laws and statistics. She wrote this in 1994 for the Ragged Edge, which was a disability magazine at the time. A major reason for the consistent denial of hatred as a motivation for violence against disabled people is that we are not perceived as constituting a viable separate group in society. A recent survey of disabled Americans report that 74% of us feel some common identity with each other and 45% see ourselves as a minority in the same sense as people who are black or Hispanic. When hate crime policymakers exclude the disability community from the Hate Crime Statistics Act, they ignore the evidence that disabled people in the aggregate constitute a political entity. They ignore the fact that when a disabled person is targeted for violence, she is attacked not simply as an individual, but as a member of a minority group. I didn't even realize that originally people with disabilities were not included. I didn't either. I just assumed, because, you know, when you see the, like, we don't discriminate against race, religion, sexuality, gender identity, blah, blah, blah. It always says disability in there. But that did not actually happen until the 2009 federal hate crimes law was expanded. 2009? 2009. 
And wow. Barbara was not around to see that happen, but it did happen. Um, so the federal hate crimes laws now do uh, include crimes that are motivated by a victim's actual or perceived disability. Barbara left the L.A. Family Planning Council and went on to serve as the senior associate at the Center for Women Policy Studies, which was a feminist policy research organization. And that's where she continued her research into the way policies affect the lives of individual disabled women. Mm -hmm. And of course, as you can hear, (laughs) she has written really great stuff Mm -hmm. about all of this. Unfortunately, Barbara faced one of the hardest battles of her life when her beloved husband, Daniel, had a recurrence of cancer. Oh, no. So he was in another hospital. It was very dire. And towards the end, while visiting him in the Stanford hospital, there was a part in her ventilator that malfunctioned, and she lost consciousness and wasn't breathing. Oh, no. Thankfully, a respiratory therapist who was there, knew her, had actually worked with her before and was able to save her life. She knew that Barbara knew she needed to replace the part um, and was going to get on that. But Daniel died shortly after this incident and she became completely consumed with grief, with grief. And also like all of the shit you have to do when your spouse or close family member dies. There's Mm -hmm. just a lot of fucking shit to go through. And it, it just fell to the bottom of the list. She needed a lot of other stuff to do. Mm-hmm. Just 18 days after Daniel's death, Barbara died after her ventilator failed again. She was alone this time? Yep. She was just 46 oh. years old. Oh, my gosh. So a tragic end to Barbara's life. But I, I read this quote from this um, magazine. That's a, it was a magazine that's specifically for ventilators. And the person knew her personally and wrote very eloquently and beautifully about like how, you know, we have these tools that help us stay alive, but we also need to manage them. And, Hmm. you know, it's understandable. Do that self-care. Yeah, it's understandable why it didn't make it to the top of her list. But it's sad. Yeah. But one of the things he said is, you know, uh, the ventilator one night failed but it had allowed her to live all so many other nights Mm -hmm. and that was just i thought a really beautiful comment in 2011 10 years after her death the center for women policy studies which was where she was working sponsored an online series of academic papers in her memory they're called the barbara waxman fiducia papers oh researchers from all over the world including a group advocating for the rights of women with disabilities in africa submitted papers on the work they're doing to further the rights of women with disabilities. And they're building upon the legacy of Barbara Waxman Fiducia. That's awesome. Yeah. So that's the story of Barbara Waxman Fiducia. That's amazing. It's like wonderful to highlight, you know, a community that doesn't, it doesn't cross my mind. And I like being aware of that pay more attention, see more people. (laughs) Right. I think I'm trying to be more cognizant of my own areas where I am not seeing, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm not noticing what's going on. So I, I found her story fascinating. And of course it made me go down a thousand rabbit holes and I (laughs) did a lot of studies studying on stuff that didn't end up in the thing, but it regardless, I learned a lot. Yeah. So I um, use the Overlook No More New York Times obituary by Denise Galeen. I use Wikipedia specifically for like the disability rights and hate crimes laws and things like that. The I mentioned that ventilator uh, newsletter that had that really beautiful piece about her. That was called Risks by Rick Santina for International Ventilator Users Network. Uh, Disabled Couple Faces Benefits Cut by Jay Matthews for the Washington Post. And then Barbara's own um, writings, which were uh, Protecting Reproductive Health and Choice by Barbara Faye Waxman for Rehabilitation Women's Perspective, the Up Against Eugenics one for Sexual and Disability Journal, um, and then the Sexual Imagery one for Sexuality and Disability Journal. 
And I also used a New York Times article called Abortion Issue Divides Advocates for the Disabled by Stephen Holmes. Um, Barbara also wrote a really incredible chapter in a book on just specifically on hate crimes towards people with disabilities, and it's called Hate. And that's in the Ragged Edge, the Disability Experience. And then last but not least, Alison Piet Meyer's article for Feminist Studies Journal, The Inadequacy of Choice. Awesome. Yeah. A lot, so much research. <laughs> oh, that was um, the 13 of the probably 18 or 20 I read. So. Oh my gosh, so much. Good job. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good story. Thank you. I, uh, I really found her interesting and fascinating. There's literally one photo of her on the internet. One photo. One photo. Wow. So that's all you get, everybody. Okay. <laughs> I kept trying to find more. I was like, there's got to be it's, another. It's so hard when, yeah. <laughs> I think it's like she was she was famous-ish, but not famous enough. Enough, yeah. So like, I mean, because she's been featured in New York Times, the Washington Post, and LA's magazines and stuff like that, and they Still, there's like one, they all use one photo, the same fucking photo every time. See, and that's questionable of her visibility. Exactly. That there's not multiple photos. I also, just because I need, I just, I was like, everything that they mentioned when in her, her one about sexual imagery, I was like, I wonder if this, inter- this website's still available on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> and I did see the, um, that woman, Ellen Stoll, I believe was her name, was the first disabled woman to be featured in Playboy. In Playboy. I, that I could find. We're not going to put that probably on our Instagram. Not today. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that I was like, well, I guess I would always put that one up. <laughs> <laughs> Get banned from Instagram. <laughs> okay, I'll go to Facebook jail for a while. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, thank you for listening to that. Oh, of course. Thank you. And thank you for sticking with us, folks. Um, and thank you to Lucas McIntyre for editing. And thank you to Jennifer Finch for our opening theme music. Make sure to check out our uh, Patreon to hear our interviews with lots of really cool people. Till next time, folks. Goodbye. Goodbye.